Hey, Carlo. Hello, Shalom. <laughs> nice to Hello. see you, Carlo. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Thanks for putting this together. Right. Thanks for joining. Hi, Francesca. Hi, Fanny. How are you doing? Hi, I'm doing great. Thank you. So nice to be back, <laughs> finally. Yeah, I was looking forward to it. Great. Hi, Excellent. Priscilla. Oh, Priscilla. I think Hi. she's connecting, yes. Yeah, I'm working while I have this in the background, <laughs> so. Excellent. You know, that's a good example for a lot of people in that uh, time zone. <laughs> you should all uh, connect even if it is in work. Anyway, so hello, um, uh, Sean Patrick in Rome. How are you doing? I'm doing great. It's a great spring day here in Rome. Uh, the first really spring day. In fact, I'm overdressed, but you know, <laughs> I'm here for you. So I wanted to look good. <laughs> Thank you so much. Hi, Barbara from Miami. How are you doing there? Hi, Jose Angel. Good, good. It's about um, nearly 30 degrees here, so we're all well. Oh, nice. So we are having, I mean, Sevilla in the south of Spain, and we are having great time also. Uh, we are with a special uh, curfew these days for the, for the uh, virus and to be careful, but it's great to be back to the connections online and to see everyone here. Hi, Desire, how are you doing? Hi, how are you? Good, nice to see you back. <laughs> yes, I'm at uh, my job, but I'm gonna try to connect it. <laughs> okay, great. And who else is here? We have also Antonio is also connecting from Rome. Antonio, how are you doing? Hello, fine, very good in Rome. Anyway. Nice to see you. Nice to see and you. we have still people joining. We will give a couple of minutes before we start with the with the, uh, our guest. Uh, I will tell you in advance. We will re explain this again later. But uh, we are going to use one of our uh, digital tools. Uh, some of you already know. Other is the first time, but it's very simple. So we will put in the in the chat uh, the website so you can go to your phone and open it. Uh, you don't have to download anything or you don't have to, to register anything. It's a website called menti.com. And Carlo already knows it. We, we use it a lot for job stuff and it's very helpful. So menti.com and it will ask you for a code. We will share it later when the time arrives. And, uh, by now, we will be just uh, saying hello to everyone who is joining. It's great to be back online after uh, a couple of months where we were preparing contents and uh, reconnecting personally with different groups. We are finally back with the programs online. And we will keep you informed about the next events. Uh, this is a trial. So we would like to know your feedback also about this. We will send you a, a Google form with some uh, short questions, like a couple of minutes uh, questions to know if this is a good time or day or time of the year. And also so that you can give us a nice feedback so we can improve every, every session. And we are also connecting today with uh, all around the world. So maybe we are already more than 20 people in the room. So I would love you to write in the chat the city that you are contacting from. So for example, I'm contacting from the city of Sevilla in Spain. So I will write yes, Sevilla. So we will see how broad is our time zone here. So we start hard, it's like eight hours difference between Chicago and Sevilla, right? We have uh, Jupiter in Florida, Austin, Prague, which is even easter than me. Nicaragua. And we have Nicaragua, great. Um, who else is in the room? You can put your name in the city there. So Rome, exactly. Great. We have some people joining uh, from, from Africa also. They will be joining a little later. They have a different timetable. And then we are missing today. I'm sorry, we're missing again our, our friends from the, uh, from the East because this is uh, uh, not the best time for them. They are sleeping now. And we have our friends from Filipina and from Vietnam and, and, and South Korea. Hopefully they will join soon. We have a representative from Mexico, right? Hello, Carla, nice to see you. And uh, we will be uh, having this uh, event, which is uh, a get together, a talk uh, that we want to build together and it will be very interactive. 
We have a, a, a guest, a special guest connecting from Rome, and uh, we have also our main host, Bara Pereira, connecting from uh, Florida. Uh, soon she will introduce uh, our speaker and, and uh, we'll let you know more about it. But first I will tell you what's going to happen. We are going to start in, in a minute uh, with, the, with the content, but now we are introducing everyone in the room. El Salvador, great. You know, it's the country with the biggest representatives in, in YPS at the moment. It's competing with US and Mexico. And we also have a great team from Poland. So hopefully we will, we will grow also there. So once we start, uh, Barbara will introduce the speaker and uh, our guest will talk about this great topic that is uh, connecting with the Pope uh, regarding to his trip to Iraq and the Middle East and, and Holy Land. So we will know more about that. Then uh, there will be a time for questions. So remember, you are always welcome to fill uh, your questions in the chat. You can send it there and then we will read them to our guest and he can uh, take a little time replying them. And, and then we will try to finish also uh, talking a little bit about what's the program that we are organizing, okay? So thank you so much to this session of uh, the Common C series with the YPS network. And please uh, let me introduce Barbara Pereira, the co-founder of Crexio Foundation, who is uh, one of the leaders of this project. And she was uh, one of the ideologies, the one who created the idea of having this special event. Hello, Barbara, how are you doing? Hi, Jose Adel, thanks so much. Hello, everybody. Um, I think for most of you, it's good afternoon. Some of you, it's good, good a late good morning. Um, so thank you so much for joining us. I just want to introduce you to an amazing guy, um, an all around great guy. I'm told he's everybody's friend. Um, and we're excited to have Sean Patrick Lovett joining us from Rome, live from Rome. Sean Patrick is um, a very proud father of two sons. He is a young professional at heart, works a lot with young people all over the world. He's, um, he's not only a professor uh, with young people um, in a variety of universities uh, and pontifical universities, but he also works with um, young adults, um, young people who have intellectual challenges, intellectual disabilities. So he's an all around good guy. Um, and what better guy to have speaking with us than Sean Patrick who's touched the right hand probably on multiple occasions of five popes and three saints. Um, I think many of us are lucky to, to just have been in the presence of a pope one of the popes or a saint. So it's it's quite exciting to have you with us, Sean Patrick, um, to share your experiences. I won't ask you to bear your shirt to show us your war room, your real war wounds, because Sean Patrick actually was a war correspondent in the field, um, and that might be another another topic um, that we have in a presentation with you, Sean Patrick. But he's written um, a best-selling book with someone that I think you're probably familiar with, you probably have not met personally, and that would be St. Teresa of Calcutta. Um, so he's, he's had an amazing experience. He was, um, well, he actually says he is Irish, African, and, Ro and excuse me, Roman or Italian. He's Irish by origin, African by birth, and Roman Italian by adoption. So thank you so much, Sean Patrick. We look forward to the discussion. Feel free to post questions, um, everybody in the chat. And here we go. Barbara, that's probably one of the best introductions I've ever had. Um, it's so good that I think I'm going to change my LinkedIn profile. And it's going to be headed from now on, Sean Patrick Lovett, all around good guy. So, so thank you for that. Uh, before we begin, you need to know that I'm in the virtual studio of Rome Reports here in Rome, and it is the result of hard work by two colleagues in particular, uh, Cesar and, 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 and Arturo, who've uh, wanted to create something special for you. 
So it's more than just a webinar. I'm not sitting in front of a, of, of, of a TV screen. We're actually in the studio and we want to give you a good solid presentation, which begins like all good presentations with an invitation. And, and that's why I want to thank you, uh, wherever you are, whoever you are, thank you for accepting this invitation and for taking the time out of your day and your life to spend a few minutes together with us. We receive so many invitations in life, don't we? Life itself is an invitation, and it's so easy to find an excuse or an alibi to say, nah, too busy, whatever, but you didn't. You accepted this invitation, and so thank you. Thank you for being here. Barbara, your introduction was, was impeccable. Thank you so much. Yes, African by birth, Italian by adoption, but really all that matters is I'm, I'm Irish, and, and you get that in the Sean Patrick and, and my Irish identity is very powerful because it gives you a clue as to who I am and to why I am. Um, my being Irish means I'm, I'm Catholic. I'm, I'm very Catholic. I come from a very strong Catholic tradition, a tradition that's suffered for its faith. So it, it helps me to understand maybe others who've done the same. So there, there are two things there. One, I'm Irish. But I'm also a communicator. I don't actually know how to do anything else. Um, I can just about change a light bulb and, and, and a flat tire. But um, when I was growing up, I, I never wanted to be an astronaut, maybe because I'm afraid of heights or, or a doctor, the sight of blood, you know, that kind of stuff. Um, I know that when my peers, the little kids on the block, were around playing with toy fire engines, I was playing with toy microphones. That's all I ever wanted to be. I wanted to work in radio. I wanted to work in communications. And, and God was good because he allowed me to be who and, and what I am. It was, the, um, it was the 1970s when I came to Rome. Um, <laughs> In, in a real world, I'd, I'd love to be out there meeting you and shaking your hand and saying, hi, who are you, where are you from, uh, and so on and so forth. But I wonder how many of you remember the 1970s. When I arrived in Rome, Elvis Presley was still alive and singing. When I arrived in Rome, um, George Lucas still couldn't find funding for a crazy science fiction movie project he had called Star Wars. Um, there were two young kids, Steve Wozniak and, and Steve Jobs, and they were just figuring out how to set up a company, a tech company, that they wanted to name after a fruit. That was the 1970s. It was a very innocent time, and that was when I arrived in Rome. And so, question one, if you were me, and even if you're you, you're coming to Rome, you're coming to the Vatican. What's going on in your head? What are you imagining? When you think Vatican, what do you think? That's the first question. Um, Jose Anico, if you can pose that question, I'd be very curious to see. It's a brainstorm. There are no correct answers. Excellent. Some of you have probably so, been to Rome, some of you have been to the Vatican. But just, I'd be very curious to know. When you think Vatican, what do you think? Great. So we will now uh, um, invite you all to join, uh, take your phone or whatever resource device you have, even in the computer, you can do it. And if you can go to the, the website menti.com, we will uh, just share also the screen so you can see it. Uh, you have it here. So if you go to menti.com, you have here the instructions, menti.com, and there is a code that is uh, here written. I will also copy it in the chat so, uh, so you can uh, also uh, check it there. And you go to menti.com and you introduce the code, which is 14856519. And right away, you can just start typing your answers to that questions. What do you think when you think Vatican? Let me, exactly. Thank you, Barbara. So that's the code and that's the, that's the website you go to www.menti.com. We already have people answering offices, old history, Pope and Pope. So the more inputs, the bigger the word. 
Go ahead. You still have some time. We have already seven people replying. So you go to this website, www.menti.com, and then the code is 1485-6519. Old God, beauty, holy city, breathtaking tradition, tourists. <laughs> I can see that too. Pope, Renaissance, Christianity. We still have a, a few seconds, uh, uh, Sean Patrick, uh, unless you want to. That's it. No, that's fine. That's great. That gives me a I hope of everyone is uh, able to see it, right? I can see you it can... very clearly. Excellent. Uh, maybe Carlo, Barbara, can you confirm? You can see the, the share screen of Menti. Perfect. Great. We still have more inputs. We are up to 12 people. Okay, I think we've got the picture. That's great. Excellent. Go Thank ahead. you. Excellent. We'll come back to the to the virtual studio now. All right, we're back in the virtual studio. Thank you. Thank you. Isn't it? Don't you just love the 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 what technology allows you to do in terms of interaction? That's great. So yes. Those were all the things that, that I was thinking. You may be interested to know, and you can try it. It's a great after-dinner party game. Uh, ask the people around the table the same question. When you think Vatican, what do you think? Statistically, and people have done studies on this because for marketing purposes uh, and for communications purposes, it's important to know what are people thinking? 80%, eight people out of 10, when you say Vatican, will think of the place. It's the postcard. It's, it's the picture in your head. It's probably the Basilica of St. Peter's. And then right after that, and we, we saw that on the wall there, yes, art, beauty, the Michelangelo, the Sistine Chapel, the Vatican is, is, is the home to some of the greatest art in the world. And right after that, yeah, old, uh, something, something ancient. The Vatican goes, goes way, way back in time. And we think old, we don't just think decrepit, we think traditions. And then immediately, well, yes, nobody said Swiss guards. I'm surprised. A lot of people associate the Vatican with the Swiss guards, and they are, they're a wonderful representation to the Vatican. Then it gets a bit heavier. Um, there are a lot of people who think the Vatican has lots of money. Not true. The Vatican does not have a lots, of, lots of money. I think there's no interview I've ever been on where I haven't been asked, you know, you Catholics are always talking about feeding the poor and helping other people. Why doesn't the Pope just sell off some of that art in the Vatican? Well, of course he can't because it doesn't belong to him. It belongs to you, it belongs to me, it belongs to my children, your children, your, your nephews and nieces. The Pope is just the custodian. He's there to make sure that it's passed on from one generation to the next. Then it gets more interesting. A lot of people associate the Vatican with power, but you have to ask, is that hard power or soft power? The Vatican has represented the Holy See because we mustn't confuse, but there's a lot of confusion. The Vatican, Holy See, Catholic Church, they're different things. The Holy See is represented on most international organizations. The Holy See, the Catholic Church has a say in many important decisions in the world, but it's a soft power. It's a power that's exercised through our, through our embassies, our nuncios all over the world. Um, but yeah, the biggest word there on the wall, the most common word, of course, the Pope, we associate the Vatican with the, it's the home of the Pope. And um, I guess that's what I'm really here to talk to you about because yeah, I've worked with and known five Popes. And, and that's where the, uh, the next question comes up. Don't cheat now, no Googling. I want to know in, how many seconds shall we give them, Jose Angel? You've got 20 seconds to tell me how many popes you can name going backwards, starting with Pope Francis, go. Jose Angel, you're muted. 
That was your cue. How's yes, that? sorry. So now we are, yeah, thank you. We are uh, now back here. So in, in two seconds, I will switch to the next slide so you can start clicking. We have 20 seconds, as uh, Sean Patrick said. So let's go. Starting from Pope Francis and going backwards, how many popes can you name? And that's it. I already have my answers here, but I cannot use it. So I. Okay, maybe you we can also write the names. We have the first contestant that is just writing the number. That's good. But we can also name them. Yeah, up to five, right? So we have first candidate who would names. Let's see if anyone can join to that. Next question will be harder, right? It's like, where they where were they uh, born and which football team they support? <laughs> no, 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 no. Okay, all right. It's just a tease. It's a game. We can come back, Jose Ankel. Perfect. Uh, you can come back to the virtual studio. It's it's just here. You go. It's it's a provocation. Um, I'll, I'll I'll tell you a secret. So so I teach at different universities around the world. Uh, and, and often with my students, I'll, I'll throw out the question, the same one I just gave you, and say, you know, I work with five popes, uh, how many can you name, going backwards, and I'm talking about students about in their, in their early 20s, right? So I hear Francis, uh, Benedict, uh, John Paul II, John Paul II, John Paul II, and it's, mm, yeah, uh, can, can you, you know, are you good at math? Now, have you ever figured, if, there's a, if it was a John Paul II, there had to have been a John Paul I, and then it, then it gets difficult, you see, because going any further back, then it's really, it's really hard. You have to study church history. Once, I was at a very prestigious university. Charity says, I, I cannot tell you the name. And someone at the back of the class shouted out, St. Peter. I mean, really? Seriously? Do, do I look that old? No, no, I don't go back all the way to St. Peter. It was Francis, Benedict the Sixteenth. John Paul II, John Paul I, John Paul I, let's not forget him, and St. Paul VI. You want to see them? Here they are. Paul VI, St. Paul VI, who died in August of 1978 after a pontificate of 15 years. John Paul I, who wanted to take the name of Paul VI and John XXIII, the first pope in history to take two names, who died after 33 days. Meditate on that number. 33? Who else needed 33? In that case, it was years to do what he had to do. I believe, I know that John Paul II chose the name because he wanted to create continuity with John the 23rd, Paul the sixth, and John Paul the first. And then of course, Benedict the 16th, and we all know, yeah. Um, okay, so um, Francis, he's the guy in white uh, sitting next to me. All right, never mind. You, you get, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I shouldn't have put that picture in there, but it's, it's, it's pure vanity, but I just, I couldn't help myself. It's a, it's a great picture. Don't ask me what we were saying. No, I wasn't listening to his confession. A lot of people ask me that. Moving, moving on, question. If you were sitting where I was sitting next to Pope Francis, what would you ask him? What would you say to him? Ozzy Angel, back to you. Let's go. So now this is the question. You can type your, uh, your question here and we will read them. This time will be one by one, uh, Sean Patrick. You will, they will appear one after the other. So what would you say to Pope Francis if you met him? So in the meantime, maybe I can tell you a little story. I was uh, there, uh, some part of, I've been living in Rome only for five years, but I was uh, a witness of the change from uh, Benedict XVI to uh, the Pope Francis. And I was with a friend in the St. Peter's Square for the first mass of Pope Francis. And we have seen the change of generation because suddenly, 
everybody was with the iPad or with the phone taking the image. So nobody was clapping. So the noise was much down and we can talk to him. So we said to him, uh, uh, Pope, uh, Holy Father, we pray for you. So he turned and said, thank you. <laughs> and that was just the difference because nobody was uh, making noise. Everybody was with the screen. Right? So we had the first question, how do you like to pray? That's a good question that we can ask Pope Francis. Um, there is another question. Sorry. There is another question. What can I pray for? Good. We'll take, what will, we'll take three. Okay. What will Jesus do today with this confusing world? Fantastic. Brilliant. Okay. Come back to me in the virtual studio. Let's go. Uh, thank you. Thank you. It's, it's again, it's, it's just a way to, to get you involved and to interact. You don't have to publish your question, but it's a curious question to ask yourself. Um, hopefully the day will come when you, you may be there at a public audience, when we have the public audiences again, and you get the opportunity to meet him. And it would be very sad if you ended up like a lot of people do. They said that all kinds of things they're going to say. I want the Holy Father. I want you to pray for my country, my family, for me. And they get there in front of the Pope and they kind of go, um, um, um. And it's, it's, it's very embarrassing for everybody. So start practicing, formulate your question right now while you're still in time. Of course, Francis loves to pray. And, and, uh, but they, so, so did they all. When I used to travel with John Paul II, when we'd arrive in a country, he would always stay in the nunciature, which is the Vatican embassy. And the first thing he would do would go to the chapel. Before meeting anyone, before doing anything, he goes straight to the chapel and pray. And sometimes the organizer of the trip would have to go and kind of tap him on the shoulder and say, um, Holy Father, you know, the president is waiting or, or, or whatever. But, but prayer, yes, that's prayer. It's so, it's so central to who we are and to, to our relationship with God. Let's get back to the popes very quickly. Quick rundown here. So we were starting with Pope St. Paul VI. What do you know about him? What do you remember? Time goes by. Our memories are so short. Um, I was reading an article just today about how, and it's almost sad to say this, how we Catholics have some of the shortest memories on the planet. We, we, we forget so easily that, that there's a continuity in our church. We believe in the Holy Spirit. And so we, we, we believe that the Pope is the person we need at this particular moment in time. Paul VI was the last Pope to wear the crown. He was the last pope to wear gloves. When I started working in the Vatican, the pope could not touch or be touched. That's why he wore gloves. Paul VI, one of the first things he did was 1964. He went to the Holy Land. He was the first pope to fly in an aircraft, Paul VI. There he is, black and white picture in the Holy Land. Uh, being mobbed by the crowds, uh, the, 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 the historic value, the spiritual value of seeing the Vicar of Christ walking along the same streets that Jesus walked along. I mean, the power of that image. This was 1964, not so long ago. Um, here's John Paul I. When, when you see me talk about John Paul I, I smile because he was the first Pope I hugged. John Paul I was the one who said, no crown, when he was asked the day before what was supposed to be his coronation, when they asked him, Holy Father, which crown would you like to be crowned with? He said, crown? The only crown that Jesus was crowned with was a crown of thorns, no crown. If Paul VI taught me the dignity of the papacy, looking up to the papacy, John Paul I taught me the humility of the papacy, stepping down, speaking heart to heart. There's this wonderful image of him with this young altar boy during, during a papal audience where the Pope puts aside his prepared speech and, and, and starts a dialogue with this child. And you kind of remember that the same thing happened about 2000 years ago and the words were, let the children come to me, am I, am I right? John Paul I 
makes me think so much of Francis, or should I say Francis, makes me think so much of John Paul I. But of course, everybody, when we say Pope, he's John Paul II for, for an entire generation. Why? John Paul II was Pope for 26 years, five months, and 17 days. Yeah, I know, I was, I was there. And if Paul VI taught me dignity, John Paul I taught me humility, John Paul II taught me geography because of all the travels we did, but most of all, the power of gesture. Do you remember that this is what he used to do? when he was still young and sprightly, he'd go on these incredible trips around the world, seven times to the United States of America. Um, the biggest gathering ever in the history of the world in Manila in the Philippines for World Youth Day, he'd come down from the plane and he would kiss the ground. The Pope, not just the pilgrim Pope, but the Pope who teaches the power of gesture. Getting closer to our own time, there he is in the Holy Land, uh, it's the year 2000, the Jubilee year, it was his desire, his wish. He's on Mount Horeb there, looking out over, literally over, over the promised land. Benedict XVI is alive and well, um, 93 years of age and as sharp as, as a tack. Uh, there he is sitting in the Vatican Gardens. Benedict XVI taught me the power of listening. Benedict XVI is a theologian, is a philosopher. Uh, you have to stop, you have to take time, you have to read and listen to him carefully to get the message. And of course, there he is too. And I was there, there we are, uh, in the Holy Land as well. We've just come out of the mosque. We all have to take our shoes off, of course. I remember some cardinals couldn't find their shoes afterwards, but there we are. And here's our Pope John, our Pope Francis, um, when until recently he could still go out and do what he loves best, which is be among, among the people. I want you to watch these, there are three pictures. Look at them, concentrate, and then you don't have to write anything down this time, but just tell me what they communicate to you. One, two, three. What do you see? Yes, you see a man dressed in white, placing a note, a handwritten note that he has devised in a crack in an old wall. Of course, we know where that wall is. We know that's the Wailing Wall and it's in Jerusalem. And we know what that gesture means. But seeing those three images back to back, I'd like to think that they communicate the same thing to you as they do to me. And the word is continuity, because that's one of the keys to the papacy. It doesn't matter who the man is or what his name is. Yes, that's good and important, and it's, it's great for the history books, and we can talk about why John Paul I is John Paul I and so forth, but what really makes the papacy important is continuity. Each man is building on something that the man before has left behind. And so if you're gonna take anything away from this presentation, I'd love you to think about that, the papacy as continuity. So I told you what the other popes have taught me, but I haven't told you what Francis is teaching me. We use the present continuous in English. Uh, I'm still learning. But one of the things that he's taught me very powerfully in the last eight years is this. It's the power of touch. Reaching out to others. It, it sounds strange to say because here we are in a virtual situation um, and we're in a locked down world. But here's a Pope who goes out to the peripheries and is not afraid to touch. There was someone else who taught me the same thing. She's the same too. Mother Teresa of Calcutta. I worked with her in Calcutta, and it was one of the first things that she taught me. Um, I was young, I was very full of myself. You know, I was the young journalist. I arrived with my cameras around my neck and my, my pen behind my ear and my, my notepad under my arm, and I was gonna change the world. And I arrived at her convent in Calcutta, and the very first thing she said to me was, take it off, 
And I went, what do you mean, mother? She said, no, 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 all that, all that nonsense. You're not going to need that. I said, why? She said, because you're going out with my sisters to work in the center that I run for lepers. I'd never seen a leper before. I had no idea what leprosy was. And she said, you won't want to use your eyes because it's not a pretty thing to look at. You won't want to use your nose because, you know, leprosy is rotting flesh and it smells. You don't want to use your ears because it's painful and they cry at night. You want to use your hands because they need human touch. Never forget the power, the power of touch. Um, another question, and, and the question, you have it, it's over to you, Ozzy Anakil. I think this is the last one, so stay with us. Last question. Yes, please. yes, perfect. We go for it. Uh, I'm sorry, but we will have to go back to the, um, to the website. It's menti.com. But this time we're in a different, um, in a different uh, code, okay? So let's go to the new one and it will be shown in the screen, okay? So maybe you can refresh it or go back to menti.com and now the code is 8379217979, okay? We will put it, sorry, let's go there. Here you While I can anticipate the question to you, um, that was the introduction to what we're here to talk about. And my question, there it is. What do you think makes a Pope a Pope? What are the qualities? What are the characteristics? What are you looking for in the figure of the Pope? What do you think the world is looking for in the Pope? What do you think the church needs in the figure of the Pope. Now, today, 21st century, your country, wherever you are. That is beautiful. That is so beautiful. I'm reading them now. That is exquisite. Clarity and conviction of the truth in a confusing time. As a communicator, you touch my heart with that. Authenticity, isn't that the key to communication too? Fatherhood, oh my gosh, as, as a father, how beautiful. Care for everyone. Christ, of course, his representative in the world. The connection with Jesus. Fidelity, peacekeeper, exquisite. Balance of empathy and courage to communicate truth. This is gorgeous. This is beautiful. It, can, we, can, we, can we do a screen uh, yes. shot of this? Uh, because it. there's some beautiful things coming out here. I'd, I'd hate for them to be lost in the, in the ether uh, after, after, because there's some, there's some, each one of these points is something we could stop and, and, and reflect on. Thank you. Can we come back to the virtual studio? There we go. Great. So you, you anticipate me. You anticipate me with a, lot, with a lot of what you've just said. Of course, you've actually said it better than I could. Um, I can just share what, what I think. This is the same as you. I think the Pope is Christ's representative in the world. And I think he is trying to be Jesus in the world today. And he's constantly listening to the Holy Spirit, and he is helping us and others to carry their cross, whatever it may be. This Pope is constantly reminding us through his gestures, as the others have done, that words are not enough. We need the words because we use the words to communicate, but they must be connected with actions. Words and actions, that's what gives credibility and that other beautiful word I just saw, authenticity. What else is he doing? He's, he's telling us we have a right to be happy. We, we, as God wants us to be happy, which is why we need to take care of the world we live in, the environment. We need to take care of other people. We need to care. And he wants us to be communicative. He wants us to create relationships, which is exactly what we're doing now. We're using the technology 
we are using this wonderful opportunity to create a relationship. But there is something else, and I saw it on the wall. This is a muralis, it's a wall painting just down the road here in Rome outside the Vatican. It's courage. Yes, the Pope is teaching us to be courageous. To be courageous means to step out of your comfort zone, to, to put self aside for a moment and to face whatever risks or dangers there may be to defend something you really and truly believe in. This is another muralis and this one is in Iraq. And that brings us to the trip. You know the Pope was in Iraq, I hope you do. Did, did you follow any of that trip? I hope you did because it was a marker in history. When we dare to say we're proud to be Catholic, you can be proud to be Catholic when you have a leader like our Pope who steps outside his comfort zone when everyone else is telling him to stay where he is, don't go. That's what the advisor said. There's a pandemic raging. We can't guarantee the security. There's terrorism. Don't go. Stay where you are. Stay where it's safe. And he went. Despite all odds, despite all advisories, he went to Iraq. I'm going to show you just a small clip, not because I don't believe that you did watch, but even if you did, watch again and listen. This is Pope Francis in the city of Mosul, a city where terrible things happened. Watch and listen. Pope Francis arrived in Mosul, the city ISIS destroyed and occupied for three years. From the car, he could see the ruins of the destroyed churches. He was greeted by olive branches and flower petals in the church square of Hoshalbiea. Amidst the ruins of the Syro-Catholic, Armenian Orthodox, Syro-Orthodox, and Chaldean churches, Pope Francis prayed for victims of ISIS. Lastly, this white dove was released as a sign of peace and renewal. For many Iraqis, it represents that where once there was death, the Pope brings life. Did you hear that? Where there was death, the Pope brings life. Take out the word Pope, substitute it for the word Jesus or for God, and, and there you have it. Where there is death, Jesus brings life. So, you know, we, we can talk about the Pope's representative on earth and what we think the Pope is, and we can show the pretty pictures and say the nice things, but here we have the concrete action. I was invited to give a lecture at a very prestigious college in the United States. It's a college that specializes in um, technical teaching, in marketing, in, 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 it's, it's not a Catholic college at all. And I was surprised that they were inviting me. And I asked, I said, why would you ask someone from the Vatican to come and give a lecture at, at a very prestigious technical college? And they said, because we teach marketing here, and we want to know how does something like the Catholic Church manage to survive for 2,000 years with 1.2 billion stakeholders, uh, despite everything that's happened in history? What is it that you market? Think about it. What do we market? It's a strange term, but this is a technical college. They use terms. Like, what do we market? Hope, hope. Hope is what we bring to the world, and here's our Pope bringing hope. But hope's not just an empty concept. Hope comes at a price, and here's the key word. Here's my second clip, Pope Francis in Iraq. Look and listen. Pardon. This is a word chiave. The road for a piena guarigion could be still long. The Church of the Immaculate Conception, 
where this meeting was held, was used as a firing range by fundamentalists. It was later rebuilt and has become a symbol and reminder that renewal is possible. However, the church was not completely rebuilt. They didn't rebuild the area with the saint statues terrorists used for target practice. They left it untouched so that the walls riddled with bullet holes could stand as a silent witness of the event and as a sign that Christians forgive their attackers. Here we are, back in the virtual studio, and, and that's, that's it from me. At this stage, I'm very curious to hear your reactions and to know your questions. I don't know, I don't have a watch on, so I have no idea where we are in terms of time. I hope we're on time. Hosi Ankel, you're the, uh, you're the organizer and anchor for this, this uh, webinar, so you let us know. I hope we have a few minutes left at least and I'd be very curious to have some feedback from our participants. I, I'm going to interject, Sean Patrick. This was uh, phenomenal. We've had comments saying that this is um, amazing. And, and while um, all of the Robe Reports videos and, and CNN and everybody else uh, were reporting, we don't always have time to watch them. So thank you for sharing those clips. Those were comments that were shared. A question. For the young professionals and the young people living in Iraq today, how do they view the Pope's visit? Do they think that it will help invoke change? And do they really at this point have hope and have the ability to forgive or do they need more? I would invite you, thank you for the question, I'd invite you to go to the Rome Reports website. Uh, this, I'm, not, this is not, I'm not sort of advertising or, or, or pushing, but, but just because I think it's, it's, a, it's a concrete answer to your question. If you can, go to the Rome Reports website and you will see a series of mini reports. They're brief, two minutes, three minutes, don't take a lot of your time, and, and they will answer that question for you because you will see the faces of the Iraqi people and you will see the joy and the hope in their eyes. You will hear it in their voices. Can you imagine after being through the horror and the suffering that they have been through, um, the uncertainty of the papal visit because sincerely up until the last minute, we ourselves thought he's not gonna go. He can't go. And he went. Imagine, when you've been ignored by the world for as long as they have, to have one of the most prestigious leaders, world leaders, to be there in your midst. So yes, the hope is in their faces, it's in their voices, but there's another aspect that not everybody keeps in mind. When the Pope travels, he travels with an international press corps. There are 70, seven zero journalists, camera people, photographers, representing many of the most important media outlets in the whole wide world. For a country that's been, dare I say, forgotten, for people who've been forgotten, who feel they've been forgotten for so long, to have that focus, to be back at the center of the mediatic world, suddenly everybody is talking about Iraq. Suddenly everybody knows where Iraq is and is hearing about these stories. That not only gives you hope, but it gives you encouragement. So the answer is yes. Wonderful, thank you for that. And we have two, two questions and some writing. So um, one of the questions here comes from Carla um, and she asks, what does the Pope need from us, the lay faithful? Carla. Um, if you had the opportunity to ask the Pope that question, um, oh, Holy Father, Pope Francis, what do you need for us? I, I know what he's going to say to you. Uh, and it's not because I read his mind, but it's what he says to anybody who does ask that question. And even if you don't ask, actually, he asks you, please remember to pray for me. He uses that word, remember, Carla, because, you know, on a good day, I can remember to pray for the Pope. And then there's so much going on in my life. I'm so busy. And, 
And I forget because the Pope is not like number one priority. And so that word remember is important, please. And he always says, please, they're very educated. Please remember to pray for me. So if you do that, I know you'll make him very happy. Thank you. So Carlo in Chicago asks, how does the Pope and the Holy See ensure that messages re resonate and are appropriate for so many different cultures and languages. Mm -hmm. Something the Western world, something for the rest, the Western world actually will sound different to those in the Far East, for example. Brilliant question, Carlo. Thank you. You're clearly a communicator. Nice to meet you. Look forward to meeting you in person. Um, that's actually a whole separate presentation. And if it's something that you care about, it's something that we, we can do. And it's about the communications system of the Holy See. It's one of the great reforms of this papacy. It's one of the things that Pope Francis was, it's one of the tickets he was elected on to reform the communications of the Vatican and the church. And right now we have something called a dicastery for communication, which brings together all the communications media, print, radio, television, social media, uh, and, and so much more besides. Um, I personally, and again, I'm not speaking out of thin air, but from the heart and from my experience, for 43 years, I worked for the Vatican Radio, the oldest radio station in the world, which still broadcasts Carlo in 50 different languages. And it's not just the language, it's the fact that each language program, and now of course, it's not just radio programs, it's also internet uh, pages in these different languages. Um, go on to the Dicastery for Communications website, Vatican News is what it's called, and you can see all these different languages. But the people working in that section come from the country to which the news is directed. So the Vietnamese website and the Vietnamese program is run and written by people from Vietnam. They know what's going on. They understand the cultural sensitivities much better than I do, maybe better than you do. And the same goes for all the different languages, Ukrainian, Belarusian, um, Swahili. Um, can you even name 50? different languages. So there is, there's a great sensitivity to communicating a message from the heart of the church to the periphery in a language and in a way that is pertinent and identifiable to whoever is reading, listening, or watching. Are we still here? Hello, is there anybody? Yes, there? great. We are here. Uh, Barbara oh, Finger. Oh. Oh. I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so sorry. You don't read lips. I know you're a fabulous communicator, but I guess you haven't mastered reading lips yet. So oh. I apologize to Patrick. You're very tiny on my screen. Hold on. Oh, my <laughs> oh, I, <laughs> I apologize. So, Sean Patrick, um, communication is very important for um, the young professional generation. And uh, Georgina, from Washington, D.C., in the spirit of communication, um, ask, it seems that believers and the Catholic Church today are really faced with an immovable wall in the world to be able to be moving the hearts of others. So how, how can we, um, namely each of us, in wherever we live and whatever walk of life we're in, um, how can we better communicate in this professionalized communication world. Georgina, you're already a friend of mine. Um, whenever you, I'll pay for the cappuccino, uh, I'd love to sit down and chat to you. You're, you're spot on, Georgina. Did, did you know that statistically, the communications faculties in most of the world's universities are the faculties that have the most exponential growth? And, and I think that means one, because we understand how important communications are, and two, because we understand that we, we really don't know how to communicate. We're really, despite the technology, we're, we're, we're not very good at communicating. So, so spot on with your question. 
What can, what can we do? It's not what we can do, Georgina. It's who we can be, Georgina. We spend so much time and energy focused on, on doing that sometimes we forget that what's really, really important is who we are being. Communicating through example. Think of all, it's, it's a great exercise, a great communications exercise. It's another lovely after dinner conversation. Go around the table and ask people, who do they admire most as communicators? Who's their model for communication and why? And a lot of the time, the people that they will identify will be people who are not particularly beautiful or brilliant or powerful or rich or, but they're just good people. My grandmother, my Irish grandmother, her name was Lillian. She couldn't read or write Georgina, but my goodness, could she communicate? She was the one who taught me how to pray. She was the one who taught me about the saints, who, who set my heart on fire for love of God. A woman who couldn't read or write, who grew up on a farm in Ireland. Don't do, be. Thank you so much, uh, Sean Patrick. That's amazing. Thank you so much for your time. I would like to thank also the whole team of Ron Reports for taking the time on a Friday. I know you are very, very busy with news reports all around the world and sending the, the news before everybody close for the weekend. So thank you so much, Sean Patrick. We love the contents that you provide us and the, the information, the insights and the, your experience. And we would like to talk to everyone about uh, this new project we are uh, willing to launch. We would love to have uh, all you guys involved in creating great contents for young professionals. So I would like you to think about the two, three friends to whom this content will be amazing. And maybe next time we, we will need to, to buy a server to create the, the network. <laughs> and hopefully we will be putting this light on the wall and it's so needed. So thank you so much, Sean Patrick. We will be in contact for, for next meetings and next connections. Thank you. It was great. Is it over already? I mean, I'm, I'm just... Yeah, walking. we would like to keep it very tight on time because uh, then people will trust us when we say one hour. It's okay. <laughs> that was great. Thank you. Thank you for being here. It was a joy and a pleasure and an honor. Um, see you next time. God bless. Thank you, Sean Patrick. Thank you, Sean Patrick. Back to you, Barbara. Thank you so much, everybody. Thanks, Sean Patrick, again. And it appears from the questions and the interest, Sean Patrick that we're gonna to have to do this again with several more of your topics. So bye everybody, happy Easter, have a happy Holy Week. Take care, see you next time. Bye. Thank you, bye-bye. We're closing now, thank you so much and have a great weekend. Thank you.